Good evening. It's nice to be with uh, each of you uh, to talk about uh, the series of books that I have been writing on the Civil War in Virginia uh, from the moment of Lee's retreat across the Potomac following the Battle of Gettysburg uh, through the end of 1863. Uh, those six months uh, of the Civil War have largely been ignored uh, by historians uh, because they produce no big battle. Uh, there was no Chancellorsville, there was no Fredericksburg, there was no Second Manassas in those six months. Uh, and so uh, historians have always tended to pass very lightly uh, over this period of history. Um, all the attention shifts out west uh, to Chattanooga uh, and Chickamauga and the operations that occur there. Uh, and it's as though uh, the historian pushes the fast forward button uh, between uh, Lee's retreat uh, over the Potomac uh, following Gettysburg and the start of the Overland Campaign uh, in uh, May of 1864. Uh, and this leaves the, uh, the general reader uh, and student with the impression that in the second half of 1863, uh, the two principal armies in the East uh, the Army of the Potomac under Major General George Meade and the Army of Northern Virginia under General Robert E. Lee um, essentially did nothing or very little. They, they licked their wounds, they recovered from Gettysburg, they skirmished a little, and, and, and there were a few uh, maneuvers, but nothing of, of great importance happened uh, in Virginia uh, for half a year. And even if you stop and thought about that uh, for a brief moment, you would probably suspect uh, that that is far too simplistic uh, a, a recounting uh, of events. A, and in fact, uh, there was a great deal of activity in Virginia uh, in those six months between Lee's retreat over the Potomac and the start of winter quarters in December uh, of 1863. Uh, there was a great deal of fighting, uh, division and core level combats, uh, a lot of cavalry action, uh, uh, several offensives by the Army of Potomac, uh, a counteroffensive by the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, and uh, so much information, in fact, that uh, it led me uh, to write a series of books uh, about it, the first three of which, uh, which you see here, uh, have already been uh, published by Savas Beatty, and the fourth uh, and final volume in, in the series uh, concerning the Mine Run campaign um, uh, will be coming out uh, fairly soon. Uh, the, uh, the story, though, uh, begins uh, with what is actually the final forgotten chapter of the Gettysburg campaign. In all major histories of the war, uh, basically, the campaign is brought to a close when Lee retreats over the Potomac uh, and destroys his bridge behind him. Uh, and we have the famous set to between uh, Halleck and Lincoln on one side and Meade on the other, with the administration unpleased that Meade has allowed Lee uh, to get away and, uh, and, and Meade's demand to be replaced as commander of the Army of the Potomac and, and the, the federal government you know, having to mollify him. Uh, and that, that seems like a nice clean point uh, to end the Gettysburg story, which of course is a long and complex story. And if you've written a book uh, that covers the, the invasion through the battle and then the retreat to the Potomac, you've already uh, you know, uh, put a lot of ink on a lot of paper. Uh, and so this seems like the, the, the perfect moment uh, to conclude uh, a, a very rigorous study. But in fact, the Gettysburg campaign does not end uh, when Lee retreats across the Potomac. It continues uh, for another two weeks. In fact, it's not come to an end until the very first day of August of 1863. And if you were to look at the official records of the War of the Rebellion uh, and peruse the Gettysburg volume, uh, you would discover that that is where uh, the official records uh, bring the campaign uh, to an end. Uh, so uh, the, the first book in my Meet and League series deals with this final forgotten chapter uh, of the Gettysburg campaign. So uh, just sort of to set the stage, we all know what happens in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on July 1st through 3rd of 1863, uh, one of the great battles in history, one of the greatest battles of uh, the war between the states, a real touch and go thing that could have swung either way, uh, but ultimately saw the Confederates defeated, uh, forced into retreat. Uh, they pulled back toward the Potomac uh, the federal army followed them. Both armies had been shot to pieces, had lost a lot of key leaders. Uh, supply lines were in disarray. Uh, troops had walked themselves out of their shoes and, and, and their, their uniforms. Uh, but eventually, uh, the Confederates successfully got back uh, to the Potomac. 
only to discover that the bridge they had left at Williamsport had been destroyed uh, by Union cavalry on July 3rd of 1863. Uh, the Potomac River was in full flood uh, and there was no way for the Confederates to get across it back into uh, Virginia. Uh, and this meant that Lee had to turn uh, and make a stand while his engineers hurriedly cobbled together a makeshift bridge. Uh, the Army of the Potomac arrived uh, far sooner than Lee would have liked and began to go into line around the Confederate uh, positions uh, between Falling Waters and Williamsport, uh, which the rebel army uh, had uh, encased uh, very quickly in a line of formidable entrenchments. And when the Federals saw those entrenchments, it, it gave them pause. Uh, Meade, of course, had only been in command of the Army since June 28th. Uh, so uh, he's in a very difficult spot. He's just taken up the reins of command. He hasn't you know, put his administrative stamp on the army. He's lost three core commanders, over 300 officers, 23,000 men. Uh, and uh, he is well aware that the Army of Northern Virginia has not been routed, that it's still a very dangerous foe. Uh, and so he, uh, he plans to proceed with due caution. Uh, he's not simply going to throw his men into a precipitous attack against Confederate earthworks, uh, and he holds a council of war uh, prior to launching a, a army-wide reconnaissance in force, uh, and his corps commanders advise taking a little extra time to get the army uh, in better condition, better shape, to let some reinforcements flow in, uh, and Meade sees merit in that and uh, believing that the Confederates cannot get across the Potomac uh, he feels that he has an extra day, so he postpones uh, until uh, July 14th. But when word of that postponement reaches Washington, a Union General Chief, Henry Halleck, uh, uh, sends him a very angry telegram uh, telling him uh, no councils of war, attack immediately. Uh, and so on the morning of July 14th, the federal skirmishes go forward, uh, but discover that the Confederates are, are gone. They, they had slipped across the Potomac the preceding night. Uh, using a, a ford that was just barely passable, uh, and, uh, and that makeshift bridge with the rebels then uh, destroyed behind them. Uh, and so Lee had managed to get safely back into Virginia. Uh, and there were very mixed feelings about this uh, in the Union Army. Uh, a lot of men uh, believed that uh, this uh, was a great tragedy, that Lee should never have been allowed to escape. A lot of others, including many Union officers, Looking at the Confederate earthworks, uh, believed that, uh, in fact, the Army of the Potomac had been fortunate that any attack on, on those earthworks would have been a uh, disastrous. Uh, in the uh, halls of the federal capital, uh, there were not mixed feelings, and Lincoln was very distraught. He believed that a golden opportunity to end the war uh, had been lost, especially in light of Union successes along the Mississippi at Vicksburg and Port Hudson. Uh, whether Lincoln was right or wrong in that perception uh, is something that, that we can debate forever, but it was his perception, therefore it was his reality. Uh, and, um, and, and he uh, conveyed those feelings to Halleck, uh, who conveyed them to Meade. Uh, and uh, so on July 14th, uh, Halleck sends this message uh, uh, to Meade, telling him that he should pursue and cut up the Army of Northern Virginia, wherever it may have gone. And he need hardly say that Lee's escape without another battle had created great dissatisfaction in the mind of President Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln, uh, of course, uh, was very unhappy. He wrote a, a, an anguished letter to me, which he never sent. Uh, but uh, Halleck's interpretation of, of Lincoln's mood is, is pretty spot on. Uh, Meade, however, believed that this was unfair. Uh, he would understand disappointment, dissatisfaction, implied censor, uh, and, and Meade believed that he had done everything that was possible, anything that anyone else could have done, and this is why he demands to be replaced as army commander. Uh, that, of course, is something that cannot be done. Meade has just won uh, the greatest victory over the Army of Northern Virginia uh, that has ever been won. You could argue that he's the first Union general to really win a clear-cut victory over the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, and replacing the hero of Gettysburg uh, within two weeks of that uh, triumph is, is off the table. Uh, and so Halleck modifies uh, the phrase uh, dissatisfaction to disappointment, says that it was merely meant uh, as a means to stimulate an active pursuit 
Uh, but this order to pursue and cut up the rebel army wherever it may have gone, that order still stands. And so uh, not in Washington, not in the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac, and not at the headquarters of the Army of Northern Virginia, does anyone think uh, that uh, the Gettysburg campaign is over? Uh, and so uh, what is going to take place between July 14th and 23rd, the very active campaign uh, in which there was the possibility uh, throughout uh, of another great battle, a chance for the Federals to do on the south bank of the Potomac uh, what they had not managed to do on the north bank of the Potomac, which was to force a finished fight uh, to conclude the Gettysburg campaign. And so what you see here is a map that gives you sort of the big picture uh, of what's going to happen, and it will help you uh, as, as, as we follow along. Uh, you can see here that Lee's army has pulled back into the lower Shenandoah Valley, and Ewell's Corps is, par, uh, is camped around the village of Darksville, which is about 13 miles uh, from the critical uh, road junction of Winchester. Hill and Longstreet are camped around Bunker Hill, which is two miles south uh, of Darksville. Uh, Darksville itself is about 10 miles from the town of Martinsburg. And here the Confederate Army uh, has come to rest. Uh, it's going to catch its breath uh, and buy time uh, for uh, the uh, federal prisoners, 4,500 prisoners uh, that it has, the 8,000 sick and wounded uh, in its trains, uh, the 26,000 head of cattle, the 22,000 sheep uh, that it's brought with it uh, out of uh, the north uh, can proceed up the valley, that is southward, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, the railhead at Staunton, uh, uh, Virginia. And so the, all of that is, of course, very slow moving stuff, uh, and Lee needs to give it a, a head start. Uh, and so he's going to rest his army. He would like to hover near the Potomac for as long as he could. He'd like to keep the Army of the Potomac close to its namesake river uh, as long as he could, uh, and, but he doesn't know what Meade is going to do. Of course, in similar circumstances a year earlier, uh, McClellan, after the Battle of uh, Antietam, uh, had lingered in Maryland uh, for a considerable period of time. Is, is Meade going to do the same thing? Uh, Lee doesn't know. Uh, so uh, he spreads his cavalry out uh, to keep an eye on what the Federals are doing, and uh, Wade Hampton's brigade, now, uh, now under Colonel Lawrence Baker, because uh, Hampton had been wounded at Gettysburg, uh, is going to cover uh, the uh, Potomac River, uh, basically uh, from Falling Waters uh, over to uh, Hedgesville, uh, and uh, Grumble Jones is going to cover things uh, from Williamsport uh, down to uh, Charlestown, uh, and Beverly Robertson's uh, two regiment brigade is going to watch uh, the uh, Shenandoah River, which like the Potomac is in full flood uh, and impassable. Uh, and so uh, Lee has guarding his strategic Eastern flank, a flooded river, and of course the Blue Ridge Mountains. And the mountains are critical uh, to uh, the, the flow of the campaign as it's going to go forward. And in particular, what matter here uh, are the gaps in the mountains, Keys Gap, the northernmost, the Snickers Gap, Ashby's Gap, Manassas Gap, and finally Chester's Gap. Uh, when the Confederates had invaded Pennsylvania, they had left uh, detachments of cavalry in these gaps. These were uh, typically uh, uh, company size at best, uh, men who by and large uh, had lost their mounts. Uh, and so they're very small detachments, and they are basically out of touch with the main Confederate Army because of the flooded condition of the Shenandoah River. Uh, and so Lee has an outpost line at Snickers and Ashby's Gap, uh, but he, he's not really in, in contact uh, with it. So uh, when he crosses the Potomac and gets into the lower Shenandoah Valley, uh, he loses contact with the Army of the Potomac, and of course the Army of the Potomac uh, by and large, loses contact with him. Uh, and so one of the facets of the campaign going forward is this dearth of intelligence for both Meade and Lee. They don't really know what their opponent is doing. They don't have precise information for much of this campaign uh, on where uh, the enemy is. The Confederate Army is in rough shape. It's down to only about 46,000 men. 
And although uh, some reinforcements are being dispatched to it from southwestern Virginia, a brigade of infantry and a couple batteries of artillery, uh, they're not going to arrive until basically this thing has played itself out. So the only real reinforcements the Army of Northern Virginia are going to get is a 1,200-man brigade under the command of Brigadier General Montgomery Course. Uh, this brigade was one of two from Pickett's division that had been left in Central Virginia uh, to guard the railroads when the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia uh, had uh, begun its invasion uh, of the North. And uh, when news of Gettysburg seeped back to Richmond on July 9th, of course, uh, was told to leave his camp in Gordonsville uh, and march into the valley uh, to link up with uh, the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, it was a tough march uh, through mud and rain, uh, but on the evening of July 13th, uh, Corse's men reached Winchester, uh, and uh, Corse got in touch with uh, Pickett, uh, who told him, look, no need to march the 13 miles uh, uh, back here uh, to Bunker Hill. Why don't you just stay uh, in Winchester for the time being? And that, that sort of routine administrative decision is actually going to wind up uh, to play uh, big, big uh, dividends uh, for uh, the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, for the Federals, uh, they have the order uh, from Halleck to pursue the Confederate Army. And in fact, Meade had already launched operations uh, below the Potomac. So uh, on uh, the uh, morning of July 14th, a 3,400-man Union force uh, made up of independent companies, uh, but independent battalions, uh, units that were still forming that had been gathered together on Maryland Heights, just north of Harper's Ferry, uh, comes down and crosses uh, the flooded Potomac River over a newly built pontoon bridge uh, constructed by the 50th New York Engineers, and they, they occupy Harper's Ferry. And shortly after Nagley's troops uh, come into Harper's Ferry, uh, the uh, two of the three brigades um, in uh, Brigadier General David Gregg's 2nd Cavalry Division uh, trot over the pontoon bridge uh, into Harper's Ferry as well. And Gregg had been sent by uh, Major General Alfred Pleasanton, who's the commander of the Army of the Potomac's Cavalry Corps, uh, into Harper's Ferry with the mission of trying to cut Lee's supply line. So the idea was to get into the valley below the Confederate Army, which of course at the point those orders were issued was still uh, on the north shore uh, of the Potomac between Falling Waters and Williamsport and, and to cut its supply line. Now, by the time that Gregg gets into Harper's Ferry, the rebel army is already back in Virginia, but Gregg does not know that. And so in the morning of July 15th, he sends the first main cavalry uh, toward Charlestown, uh, to, to see if it might be possible uh, to get astride the Confederate supply lines. Uh, but the 1st Maine runs into considerable opposition from Jones Cavalry Brigade uh, and a battery of Confederate artillery. So the Federals back up to Halltown uh, and uh, Greg says, well, I'm not going to cut Lee's supply line this way, but uh, what if I go uh, further north? And so he leaves a couple of regiments behind in Halltown to keep an eye on Jones in Charlestown, and then he takes the rest of his force up uh, to Shepherdstown, uh, which is really just across the Potomac uh, from Sharpsburg, where the Battle of Antietam had been fought. Uh, and uh, the Federals uh, sweep into uh, Shepherdstown uh, on the 15th without too much trouble. There are no Confederates there. Uh, and, and Greg outposts the area, and then he begins to send scouts out, and he very quickly discovers that there's a lot of Confederates now suddenly in the lower valley, Confederate infantry and Confederate cavalry. Uh, and so Greg, who still doesn't have a clear picture of what's going on, uh, realizes that uh, the situation has changed. He's going to hold his ground until his third brigade, uh, under uh, Pincock Huey uh, shows up. It's been ordered to reinforce him, but given no particular urging to hurry uh, because when those orders were issued, the Confederate Army, of course, was still supposed to be uh, in Maryland. Uh, and so Greg is uh, sitting here in Shepherdstown. He's got his pickets about out about four miles in front of the town, and he's waiting for reinforcements. Uh, and while Greg is doing all of this, other federal forces are also on the move. So uh, Halleck had been uh, gathering together 
whatever Union troops he can lay his hands on to reinforce Meade uh, for the supposed big climactic battle that was going to take place uh, at Williamsport. And one of the uh, principal forces that was supposed to reinforce Meade was a 6,000 man uh, body of troops, infantry, mounted infantry, cavalry, and artillery under the command of Brigadier General Benjamin Kelly. Uh, these troops had been uh, spending the war guarding uh, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Uh, and therefore they were of course widely scattered uh, and uh, when Lee had invaded the North, uh, Kelly had been told to gather his troops together and reinforce Meade. It took considerable time to pull all these troops in uh, from their, uh, their scattered outpost. And so it wasn't until uh, July 14th that Kelly had his command in hand and he moved toward Williamsport uh, to link up with Meade. But by the time he, he gets there, Meade has already left Williamsport and he's moving uh, to the Southeast uh, toward Berlin, Maryland, where he intends to throw pontoon bridges across the Potomac and cross into uh, Virginia. So uh, Kelly gets to Williamsport uh, late on the 14th. Uh, he finds no the Army of the Potomac. He, had, he telegraphs Halleck, what do I do? And Halleck tells him to cross the river and seek to do as much harm as he can to the enemy. Uh, and uh, that's a very daunting prospect because the Potomac is in full throated flood. Uh, and uh, Kelly looks around and he decides uh, Cherry Run Creek uh, and the ford there is his best chance to get over the river. Here's a picture of the ford uh, in, uh, that was taken after the war at, at the point that we're talking about almost everything in this picture would be underwater. Uh, and so Kelly uh, doesn't have a pontoon bridge. He's got three small boats uh, to use to try and cross the river. Uh, he'll, he'll gather up three more over the course of the next couple of days, but with this very small flotilla, uh, it, it takes a long time. It takes, in fact, three days uh, for his army, uh, his little army, to get over the Potomac. Uh, the current is running so fast that his little boats are swept a half mile downstream on every trip. So this is time consuming, it's difficult, it's dangerous, uh, but by uh, July 17th, Kelly is going to have his army uh, over the Potomac, and he's going to advance to the village of Hedgesville, uh, where uh, he's going to catch his breath and try and figure out what he can do. Of course, he's very nervous uh, because he, he knows that the Army of Northern Virginia is somewhere in the vicinity, uh, and if he's not very careful, he's going to bring it down on his head, uh, and uh, that could be disaster for him. So uh, Kelly is getting his men across, uh, and, and he's on the west side of the Shenandoah Valley, while Greg's cavalry is on the east side. Uh, Greg has occupied Shepherdstown on July 15th, and of course, news of that occupation uh, reaches Jeb Stewart very quickly, and Stewart determines that he's going to destroy these Yankee interlopers in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, he wants to attack early on the morning of July 16th with three cavalry uh, brigades, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the roads are very bad. Uh, it takes the Confederates far longer uh, to get to Shepherdstown uh, than they had expected, uh, but uh, eventually uh, they managed to, to get there. Uh, just before the battle begins, Stuart is called back to Army headquarters to consult with Lee, so the fighting uh, is basically directed by Brigadier General Fitzhugh Lee, uh, and this is a really tough cavalry uh, battle that takes place uh, throughout most of uh, July uh, 16th. Uh, there are really two stages to it. Uh, the Confederates uh, moving up the road towards Shepherdstown run right into outpost of the 10th Maine uh, Cavalry or 10th New York Cavalry, uh, which puts up a pretty good fight. Uh, but just as the, they're about to be driven from the field, the first Maine Cavalry arrives to stiffen federal resistance. This requires Fitz Lee to deploy uh, most of his command to drive these Federals off, and, and it gives uh, David Gregg time uh, to shake out uh, Irvin, Brigade, Irvin Gregg's brigade. Uh, Irvin Gregg is the cousin of David Gregg, uh, and they take position on high ground behind a stone wall uh, in some woods blocking the road towards Shepherdstown. Uh, the Confederates come up against them, uh, this is not a mounted action now. Everything is being done basically dismounted because this part of Virginia is laced with stout 
stone and rail fences. And so it's, it's almost impossible to move mounted cavalry formations around. Uh, the Confederates bring up their battalion of horse artillery. The Federals only have a single battery uh, to oppose them. Uh, but all of the Confederate attacks uh, are repulsed uh, until late in the day uh, when the third of the three brigades uh, Stuart had intended to throw uh, at Gregg uh, belatedly arrives on the field and joins the fight. Uh, they manage a penetration of the Union line uh, and drive the Federals back about a quarter of a mile towards Shepherdstown. Uh, but then darkness falls uh, before uh, this, this uh, slight success can be exploited. Uh, so during the evening, uh, Stuart pulls his troops back, uh, reorganizes, planning to launch an all-out attack on July uh, 17th uh, with the intent of destroying uh, Gregg's division. Uh, for the Federals, the night of the 16th is, is a very, uh, very worrying night for a couple reasons. First off, uh, they're uh, basically out of rations, they're short of forage, uh, and they're very close to being out of ammunition. Uh, in addition, Pinnock Huey's brigade uh, uh, has uh, not arrived on the field in time to participate in the combat during the day. Uh, it doesn't show up until after dark, and when it does uh, reach the battlefield, uh, Huey has a very frightening story uh, to tell uh, General Gregg. And uh, basically, uh, what has happened is that when Gregg swept north uh, to grab Shepherdstown, he cut off at Company D of the 12th Virginia Cavalry, which is actually raised in this part of Virginia. Uh, and it finds itself behind federal lines. And uh, rather than retreat to uh, its parent regiment, these uh, handful of Confederates, about 100 men, uh, basically hover in the Union rear, uh, lay weighing uh, individual uh, federal soldiers and small detachments and that sort of thing. Uh, and when Huey's brigade shows up in Harbors Ferry and it begins to move north toward Shepherdstown, uh, Huey decides to send his headquarters wagons by a different and supposedly safer route. Well, they blunder into a Company D of the 12th uh, Virginia Cavalry, uh, which has uh, now been joined by Major John Knott, uh, the, uh, one of the field officers of the Virginia Regiment, and capturing a brigade headquarters wagon, Knott says, wow, this must mean there are a lot of Federals somewhere around here. Let's go find out where they are. So he moves his small command uh, to a place called Muller's Crossroads, which is uh, between Shepherdstown and Harpers Ferry. And when Huey's command comes up on Muller's Crossroads, it runs into these Confederates, uh, there's a very, very brief exchange of fire. Uh, not with 100 men knows he's not going to stand in front of a full federal regiment that has a battery of artillery attached. Uh, but the presence of these Confederates rattles Huey to the point that he halts his movement, deploys an entire brigade, unlimbers his artillery, and prepares to receive an attack. An attack, of course, which never comes. And finally, uh, right before dark, Huey thinks that things are safe, and he goes on up to Shepherdstown, and he links up with, with Greg, but he tells him, wow, there are Confederates between us and Harper's Ferry. In other words, we're cut off. Uh, we've got all these Confederates to the west of us. We've got a flooded Potomac to the north of us. Uh, we've got God knows how many rebels to the south of us. We're essentially surrounded. Uh, and this is not really true, uh, but, but this is the only information that Greg has. And so he says, well, we can't stay here. We're going to have to retreat. And the only way that we can retreat is along a narrow trail beside the Potomac, so narrow that, in fact, most of it, we're going to have to rise single file. Uh, and it's going to take us all night, but this is the only way to escape destruction. So uh, that evening, uh, the evening of July 16th, uh, the Federals begin to pull out very quietly, uh, very slowly. They snake their way along uh, the Potomac, uh, and the Confederates who've backed up a little bit to reorganize do not uh, realize what uh, Greg's troopers are doing. And so uh, by the time uh, the, uh, the Confederates are wise up after dawn, uh, Greg is essentially back at Harper's Ferry. Uh, and so he manages to save his uh, division. Uh, this is very disappointing to the Confederates, but at least they've shoved Greg back uh, against uh, the Potomac and therefore uh, that they are not going to pose a threat uh, any longer to the Army of Northern Virginia. But uh, federal cavalry around Harpers Ferry is a worrisome thing for Robert E. Lee, uh, and it's something that he's going to have to pay uh, very close attention to. Uh, 
uh, on the other side of the Potomac, uh, Meade is gathering his, uh, his army around Harper's Ferry and Berlin, Maryland, planning to cross the river in both places. Uh, none of the Union troops look forward to going back into uh, Virginia, uh, and their commander does not either. He believes that uh, trying to push things at this point is a mistake. Uh, once Lee's across the river, he has freedom of maneuver. Uh, trying to run him to ground and force him to fight uh, is going to be almost impossible. Uh, and Meade writes his wife uh, on the evening of July 18th that the, the proper policy uh, would be uh, to, uh, to just be happy pushing Lee back into Virginia and for the Army of the Potomac to pause uh, so it can be reorganized, it can be reinforced, it put on such a footing as its advance is sure to be successful. Uh, but Meade knows that this is unacceptable. He's not going to be allowed uh, uh, to do this, so he's going to have to go ahead and, and cross the river uh, and run the chances of having a battle with Lee on Virginia soil uh, with a beat-up Army of the Potomac in uh, with a command structure that has suffered a great deal. Uh, Meade is not enamored of his uh, core commanders. He's lost his two best, Reynolds and Hancock, and he says uh, their, their places are not to be uh, supplied, uh, but he's got the army he's got, and he's got the orders that he's got, uh, and so he's going to have to do uh, what he has been told uh, to do. Uh, so, uh, the federal engineers uh, throw a bridge at Berlin, Maryland. This was harder than it might have been supposed because uh, the river has swollen to a width of 1,500 feet. Uh, after building a bridge at Harper's Ferry, the 50th New York engineers do not have enough pontoons and planks uh, to, uh, to throw a bridge across uh, the river at Berlin. Uh, the Army's chief uh, engineer, Governor Warren, had telegraphed Washington asking for additional bridging material, uh, but had warned the War Department, don't send them down the Baltimore and Ohio Canal because the rebels have broken some dams there and large stretches of the canal are therefore dry and, and useless. Send these supplies by rail. Well, unfortunately, the second half of that message somehow doesn't get to Washington and the extra bridging material is dispatched by canal boat. Uh, so it, it's, it's going to be a couple of days late getting there. Uh, fortunately uh, for the Federals, uh, they, they have some good luck. Uh, the river, uh, of course, is flooded. Uh, the current is very strong, and there's all this flotsam uh, sweeping downstream uh, toward the bridge that uh, Colonel Ira Spaulding's New York engineers are, are trying to build. Uh, and that, that, that debris is very dangerous. And so the Federals have to, to put troops out to try and, you know, is to stop the debris and, and to, to take it, uh, steer it away from the bridge. Uh, but they find that a lot of the debris that's, that's coming at them are the remains of the pontoon bridge that Lee's engineers had cobbled together uh, at, at Falling Waters. And so they're able to, uh, to salvage the remnants of Lee's bridge and use it to finish their own. Uh, and so on the evening of July 17th, the Federals managed to, to get their first bridge uh, over the Potomac. And of course, uh, as soon as they finished that, all the extra supplies that had been ordered from Washington finally arrived. So they're able to build a second uh, bridge. Uh, and what you see here uh, is, of course, a very famous photograph. Uh, most people say that this is uh, in the aftermath of Antietam uh, and not in the aftermath of Gettysburg. But nonetheless, this is Berlin, Maryland. There are two pontoon bridges, and so this would give you an idea uh, of where uh, Meade's army uh, was going to begin crossing uh, the Potomac. Uh, and so uh, the Federals uh, begin uh, to, to go over the river. On July 17th, Major General William French moves the Third Corps into Harper's Ferry. Uh, the rest of the army is going to cross the river uh, during the next two days. Uh, Major General George Sykes, 5th Corps, uh, Major General William Hayes, 2nd Corps, and Major General Henry Slocum's 12th Corps will cross the river uh, uh, at Harper's Ferry. Uh, Newton's 1st Corps uh, will go over at uh, Berlin, followed by uh, the Army of the Potomac's Reserve Artillery, Army Headquarters, uh, Buford's 1st Cavalry Division, uh, Otis Howard's uh, 11th Corps, and finally John Sedgwick's uh, 6th Corps. Six Corps. Uh, and from Harper's Ferry, 
uh, those uh, federal units are, are going to cross the Shenandoah on a pontoon bridge and go through Keys Gap uh, to join the Army of the Potomac uh, in the Loudoun uh, Valley. Uh, so the Loudoun Valley here, you can see, is on the east flank of the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains. And this is a very shrewd by, move by Meade because it puts his army on the strategic flank of Lee. Uh, and it opens up the great possibility of the campaign. If the Federals can move up the Loudoun Valley quickly and seize the gaps in the Blue Ridge, they might be able uh, to cut the Army of Northern Virginia off trap it in the lower valley, and then Meade could shove troops through these mountain passes, get south of Lee, and fight him on disadvantageous ground uh, in the northern reaches of the Shenandoah Valley. So this is the, the big Union strategy. Uh, by July 18th, uh, the Army of the Potomac is uh, pretty much uh, on its way uh, into the Loudoun Valley, uh, its cavalry has captured uh, Snickers Gap, the first of these important mountain passes uh, after a brief skirmish. Uh, and on the 19th, the rest of the army is, is, is going to come in. And once Meade's got his whole army in the Loudoun, he, began, he can begin to push south uh, with greater vigor. Uh, of course, on the other side of the Shenandoah, uh, we also have uh, General Kelly's force, which is at Hedgesville. Uh, operating under orders to do damage to Lee's army. And so on July 19th, he sends Brigadier General William Averell uh, with 2,500 men uh, toward Martinsburg. You know, Kelly is still very nervous. He tells Averell, don't provoke a great big fight. Uh, take Martinsburg if you uh, encounter very little resistance, but, but don't stick your neck out. Uh, the Federals managed to push almost to the outskirts of town, uh, skirmishing with Hampton's Cavalry Brigade under Colonel Lawrence Baker, uh, but uh, eventually Ewell sends infantry to reinforce the Confederate cavalry. Uh, they counterattack and they push Averell back toward Hedgesville. The, the, the fighting is rather brisk, but it doesn't produce a lot of casualties. Uh, but by the end of July 19th, uh, the, the uh, Federals under Kelly now know that a substantial portion, if not the entire Army of Northern Virginia uh, is uh, still in the Lower Valley. And the Army of Northern Virginia knows uh, that Kelly has a force rumored to be about 10,000 men uh, in Hedgesville. And this fight on July 19th, uh, although somewhat uh, inconclusive uh, in, in a tactical sense, is going to turn out to be very, very important uh, in, in Meade's mind uh, before uh, very long. Uh, so by the end of July 19th, Meade has gotten the entire Army of the Potomac uh, into the Loudoun Valley. He's pushed Buford's and Kilpatrick's cavalry uh, southward, uh, some distance in front of the Federals, uh, and their orders are to seize the gaps in the mountain passes and hold them until Federal infantry uh, can arrive. Now, Lee doesn't know that Meade is doing this. Uh, he's frustrated that he can get no real information uh, from uh, east of the, the Shenandoah River, but enough. Uh, enough rumor has floated back to Army headquarters to let him know uh, that the Yankees do have Snickers Gap. Uh, and that means, in Lee's mind, uh, that they're probably going to threaten Ashby's Gap soon. Uh, and although Lee does not know if Meade has moved into the Loudoun Valley or not, he knows that that would be the smartest thing for Meade to do, the most dangerous thing that Meade could do. And therefore, Lee assumes that it is exactly what Meade is going uh, to do. Meade has respect for Meade's uh, capabilities, and he is not going to underestimate his opponent. Uh, so on July 19th, Lee uh, writes to James Longstreet, in command of his first corps, and asks him to take his army uh, from Bunker Hill uh, to uh, Front Royal, to first uh, go to uh, Milltown, uh, which is across the Shenandoah, uh, from Ashby's Gap, take a look at what's going on there. If he thinks it would be best to cross the river there, he can. Uh, but uh, if he doesn't think it's disadvantageous, what Lee wants him to do is to move to Front Royal, cross the Blue Ridge Mountains at Chester's Gap, and then move on uh, to take a position along the headwaters 
of the upper Rappahannock River in Culpeper County. In other words, put the First Corps in a blocking position between the Federals uh, and Richmond. And, and Longstreet is going to move uh, on the morning of, uh, of the 20th. And so uh, Longstreet uh, begins his movement from Bunker Hill uh, going down here uh, toward uh, to Millwood, uh, right there. Uh, and as he moves from Bunker Hill through Winchester to Millwood, Montgomery Corse's brigade, those 1,200 men who had been brought to reinforce the army after Gettysburg, but who had been left in Winchester, are told march south uh, toward Front Royal. Uh, they're a lot closer to Front Royal and the uh, passes uh, in the Blue Ridge there uh, than the rest of the Corps. And this, this turned out to be an incredibly important move. So at the end of July 20th, Longstreet's Corps with Pickett's division in the lead is at Millwood. Uh, Corse's brigade is at Cedarville, just five miles from Front Royal. Uh, Federal cavalry has now captured Ashby's Gap. Uh, Meade's got the 12th Corps and Snickers Gap. He's advanced his infantry deeper into the valley. Uh, and Buford has sent Wesley Merritt's Reserve Cavalry Brigade into Manassas Gap. It ends the day uh, only uh, about a mile from Linden. Uh, and uh, and uh, the Federals have also sent uh, David uh, Gamble's uh, Cavalry Brigade uh, toward uh, Chester's Gap. And if Federal infantry can follow them quickly and, and plug up those passes, then Meade has a real chance here uh, of accomplishing what he wants to accomplish. But Meade is nervous, and understandably so. His army is not only shot up, uh, he has no idea where Lee's army is. He's lost all contact with it. And although he's got men up on these mountains, uh, the, the, the atmosphere in the Shenandoah Valley is very hazy. Uh, and so the Federals cannot see a lot. Uh, he, uh, Union scouts have not been able to penetrate the Confederate cavalry screen to bring back any information uh, whatsoever. And more worrisome, Meade has been reading Southern newspapers that are claiming that massive reinforcements are on their way to the Army of Northern Virginia. The troops are being brought up from the Carolinas and brought over from the Army of Tennessee. And of course, after the, the damage done to Lee at Gettysburg, this would be an incredibly logical thing for the Confederates to do if they had the resources to do it. Uh, big picture, we know that the Confederates do not have these, uh, these resources, that, that Bragg is under great pressure in Tennessee, Charleston is under siege, uh, there are no troops to spare, uh, and, uh, and the Confederate forces, of course, uh, in, in Mississippi are in complete disarray. Uh, but, but Meade uh, does not know that or does not fully grasp it, and so he tells Halleck, hey, look, I'm getting these uh, these." reports, the newspaper stories that Lee's about to be reinforced. And I suppose if there's any truth to that, you will let me know. And Halleck sends a message back. You don't worry about that. There's not a man who's going to reinforce Lee. The Confederates have nobody to send him. You greatly outnumber him. And basically implying that you need to act like that. You need to act aggressively. But Meade, Meade is not so sure. Uh, and so he's being not cautious. Uh, but he's being prudent. He's, he's not going to take any unnecessary uh, uh, chances. Uh, and so um, the Federals are in the, uh, in the dark about what the Confederates are doing, the Confederates in the dark about what the Federals are doing, uh, but Lee has deduced uh, what Meade's best move would be, assumed that he is making it and has begun to counter it, where Lee, uh, rather Meade, uh, is not uh, in, in that boat uh, whatsoever. And in fact, um, on the, the evening uh, of the 20th, uh, Meade uh, uh, is, is going to get information uh, that's going to, uh, to, to increase uh, his caution exponentially. A, a roundabout report uh, from Kelly, uh, which is going to come to Hagerstown and find its way down uh, to, to Meade, informs him that there had been fighting 
uh, on uh, the 19th around Hedgesville and uh, that Yule's core and Hill's core are still in the lower valley. Uh, and this stuns me because Meade had been assuming that Lee was rather logically retreating up the valley that is southward uh, as rapidly as he could with the intention of slipping through one of the mountain passes and getting back into central Virginia. And, and Meade has been operating on this supposition, but now Meade has learned that the Confederate Army is still here in the Lower Valley, and it makes no sense for the Confederate Army to still be here in the Lower Valley unless, unless it is awaiting those massive reinforcements Meade has been reading about. And awaiting those massive reinforcements, it is uh, anticipating resuming the offensive. And so here then is the great danger. If Lee is in fact being reinforced, and that is a logical conclusion given that he's staying where he ought not to be, and Meade continues to push his army down into the Loudoun Valley, he is opening a gap up in his rear that the Confederate Army could suddenly swing into to cut the Army of the Potomac off from Washington as well as Severed Supply Line, or allow the Army of Northern Virginia to slice back across the Potomac into Maryland uh, and threaten the federal capital. Uh, and Meade decides that this is too great a risk to run. Uh, he, he therefore is going to suspend the advance of his infantry uh, until he can gain greater clarity uh, on the situation. And so for the next 35 hours, Union infantry is not going to, to move. It's going to stay here. Uh, and this is going to lose uh, Meade the initiative because it's going to allow the Confederates uh, to seize uh, these mountain passes around Front Royal. Front Royal now becomes the critical point uh, and, and for rather obvious reasons. This is a drawing uh, uh, by Edwin Forbes in 1862, uh, and uh, the actual town of Front Royal would be over here. These are these are Union camps, uh, but you see why Front Royal matters because two passes in the Blue Ridge open onto Front Royal. You've got Manassas Gap here to the north and Chester's Gap here to the south. And we want to look at an aerial view. Uh, there's there's Front Royal, uh, and uh, here you have. Manassas Gap, and you have Chester's Gap. And this is the best avenue for the Army of Northern Virginia to use uh, to get back into Culpeper County uh, and Central Virginia. So these two passes, Manassas and Chester's Gap, are all important. Uh, and, uh, and thankfully for the Confederates, uh, Montgomery Corps' brigade uh, has... Uh, has gotten a head start on getting there. So on the evening of the 20th, it had camped at Cedarsville. Uh, on uh, the 21st, it crosses the two forks of the Shenandoah River at Front Royal, the North and the South Fork. Uh, they're both flooded. The crossing is time consuming and difficult. Lee has ordered pontoon bridges installed there, but they have not even begun to be put up uh, when course uh, comes through. Uh, but having gotten his 1,200 men into Front Royal, course sends most of them uh, to uh, Chester's Gap, which is the principal avenue uh, for the Confederate redeployment, but he sends a, a small force, the 17th Virginia Infantry, 250 men, uh, under Colonel Robert Simpson uh, into Manassas Gap uh, to the north. Uh, this is something of an inspired choice, uh, choice because one company uh, of the 17th had been raised in Front Royal. Uh, Simpson was from there. He's a uh, uh, a pre-war uh, militiaman and a Mexican War uh, a veteran, and he knows this area as a, a VMI graduate. Uh, and so uh, Simpson uh, goes into Manassas Gap and he deploys his men. He thinks that there's Confederate cavalry uh, in front of him, uh, but there's not. Uh, and so suddenly he's surprised uh, when Merritt's Cavalry Brigade uh, shows up and, and pushes into him. And uh, this begins a day-long battle uh, between Merritt and the 17th Virginia. Uh, the Federals uh, managed to capture about 20 Confederates on the skirmish line uh, before Simpson knows what's going on, but then he deploys uh, his men uh, effectively to blunt the Federals from pushing through his lines around Wapping House and high ground known as Wapping Heights uh, toward Front Royal. 
Uh, he sends a courier back uh, to Front Royal to spread the alarm. Uh, that courier uh, finds uh, some Confederate officers in Front Royal, uh, learns that Pickett's division at the head of Longstreet's Corps is at Cedarville. And so he rides up to Cedarville and he tells Pickett what's going on. And, and Pickett rushes his division uh, southward across Front Royal, sending a one brigade uh, uh, under, uh, under uh, Joseph Cabell with what's left of Armistead's brigade uh, to reinforce Simpson uh, at Wapping Heights and sending the rest of uh, Pickett's division uh, or what's left of it after Gettysburg to reinforce course uh, in, uh, in Chester's Gap where, where there's only been a little light skirmishing, skirmishing uh, with, with Gamble. Uh, so the stand of the 17th here, this, day, this afternoon long fight is a very gallant affair. Uh, Cabell comes up in time uh, to, uh, to stop uh, the merit from, from gaining any uh, ground. And so we get something of a stalemate here. And so Corse and Pickett between them have managed to destiny federal cavalry in, in these two passes uh, and to hold them uh, for uh, lean. Uh, now the question is what else is, is, is happening behind them? Well, we know that the federal infantry isn't moving. It's going to stand still through all of July 21st. Uh, Longstreet's marching his men hard for Front Royal. Uh, Lee has sent word to A.P. Hill uh, to move his troops to Winchester and then to follow Longstreet to Front Royal and through Chester's Gap back into Culpeper County. Uh, Yule uh, and Stuart's cavalry will remain where they were to shield the withdrawal of the army, but the expectation is, is that they will uh, return into Central Virginia within a day or two. And, uh, and Lee has sent you a word, uh, you know, if there's anything else I need to know, uh, let me know what, uh, what, what that might be. And so Yule uh, tells Lee about the fight that he has had uh, on the 19th uh, with, uh, with uh, Averell. Uh, and uh, Yule proposes that he attack and destroy Kelly's force uh, at Hedgesville. Uh, and uh, Lee likes the sound of that. Uh, he likes to hear that Yule's uh, being aggressive uh, after his, his subpar performance uh, at the Battle of Gettysburg. And so Yule uh, plots uh, Kelly's destruction, and he convenes a conference of his division commanders uh, at uh, the home known as Boydville uh, outside uh, of, of Darksville. Uh, it, it's a, a grand and elegant home. And while the generals are meeting, they have the services of a borrowed slave from uh, the Pendleton family uh, who lives nearby. Uh, and uh, the plan that they come up with is on the morning of the 21st, um, Yule is going to move Rhodes and Johnson's division up the valley, or rather down the valley, northward, uh, uh, to threaten Kelly from the front. And while Kelly is fixated on this force, uh, Early uh, with Hampton's Cavalry Brigade under Baker is going to move uh, into his rear along the Back Creek Valley. Uh, and they were going to hit him from two sides and we're going to destroy him. It's a very good plan, it probably would have worked except for the fact that uh, the, the Pendletons were unionist and they had told their slave uh, to keep his eyes and ears open when he was around Confederate generals. And so he heard the whole Confederate plan laid out. Uh, he goes uh, home, tells uh, Lucinda Pendleton what's going on. She sends her son through Confederate lines to warn uh, Kelly, uh, who uh, sends scouts into Back Creek Valley in time to spot uh, Baker's uh, brigade going into camp. And so uh, that uh, night, uh, the night of the 20th, Kelly begins to retreat back across the Potomac. On the morning of the 21st, the Confederates launch their move, but uh, just as Baker's men get to Hedgesville, uh, they see Kelly's force disappearing uh, uh, across the Potomac. And so this whole thing uh, basically uh, winds up accomplishing nothing, except that when word of this movement uh, reaches Washington and eventually reaches Meade, it's going to tend to confirm this fear that the Confederates are preparing to resume the offensive. After Ewell's gambit fails, Rhodes and Johnson go back to Darkville, Baker and early camp around Hedgesville and now become the northernmost element of the Army of, the, uh, of Northern Virginia. And this is important because it's going to confuse federal intelligence 
uh, the Federals uh, mistake Yule for Hill, uh, and so they think that it's Hill's core that has made this movement, and the Federals are going to misidentify Early's division as Hill's entire core, and the two divisions of Yule at Marksville as Yule's entire core. So they're going to think that two entire Confederate corps are here uh, in the northern reaches of the Shenandoah Valley, when in fact it's only one core, and that most of the Confederate Army uh, is concentrating now uh, at Front Royal. Uh, so uh, at the end of July 21st, this is where uh, things are. Longstreet is at the entrance to Chester's Gap. Uh, Pickett and Course are holding uh, the, uh, the exit of the pass or, uh, or near it. Gamble's still blocking it temporarily. Merritt is at the village of Linden, which is at the apex of Manassas Gap, but he's blocked from going west uh, by Cabell in the 17th Virginia. Uh, and Hill is now around Winchester. Uh, we know Ewell has two divisions at Darksville and that Early and Baker up here. The Federal Infantry remains as before. And so during the night of the 21st, both armies are basically preparing to move the next morning, depending on circumstances as they uh, find them. And what's going to happen on the 22nd is that first off, Wolf, uh, the, sorry, uh, the, the head of Longstreet's Corps is going to begin to move into a Chester's Gap. And Brigadier General William Wolford's uh, brigade uh, has the lead. It's going to run into Gamble's cavalry, which is dismounted and blocking the pass, assisted by a battery of artillery. Uh, and this basically moves the entire, uh, brings the entire Confederate column to a halt. Uh, and Wolford uh, sends back word to Longstreet and says, look, frontal attack here seems very dangerous. I suggest that we outflank Gamble uh, by sending a force uh, to the south to get around the federal uh, left flank. And when it gets on their flank, it will attack and I'll attack from the front and we'll, we'll gobble up a Gamble's Brigade and open the entrance to Chester's Gap. Now, the terrain here is very difficult. The Confederate flanking column will have to move over mountainous roads and uh, take a very circuitous route to avoid being spotted. Uh, this is, this is going to take almost eight hours to pull off, but Longstreet decides that this is, this is the best course uh, to take. So most of the day of July 2nd is given over at Chester's Gap uh, to Longstreet making this maneuver, and he assigns Pickett's division to do the flanking. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, while this is happening here, uh, Hill, Hood's uh, division, uh, now under Evander Law since uh, Hood had been wounded at Gettysburg, uh, has come in uh, to Manassas Gap, and it has relieved uh, the 17th Virginia and Cabell, and they begin to make a, a, a very difficult uh, cross-mountain march over to rejoin uh, the uh, First Corps at the exit uh, to uh, Chester's Gap. Uh, and late in the day, uh, the picket and Wolford uh, managed to launch their attack against Gamble, uh, who wisely does not stand. He's chased away. Uh, the 17th Virginia and Cabell managed to arrive just at the height of the action to, to help uh, seal uh, the Confederate victory. Uh, but Gamble is now pushed out of Chester's Gap. And that night, uh, Longstreet's Corps begins to flow through Chester's Gap uh, toward uh, the upper Rappahannock and Culpeper County, uh, and Hill's Corps uh, is, is going to follow him into the gap. So the Confederates are now uh, accomplishing uh, what they are wanting to accomplish. Uh, as the night wears on, most of Law's troops uh, leave the gap uh, and rejoin the First Corps. They leave uh, Benning's Brigade with two Alabama regiments here, on the morning of the 23rd, they're going to replace, uh, be replaced by a brigade uh, from Ewell's Corps, uh, Ambrose Wright's brigade uh, from the Second Corps it is going to come in and, uh, and take over the defense of Chester's Gap about nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, Wright uh, is uh, under arrest. He, he's had a set two with his division commander, uh, Richard Anderson. Uh, and, and so uh, you have uh, Colonel Edward Walker 
in command of the brigade, which only has 600 men left from Gettysburg. Uh, but as Benning uh, turns over uh, control of uh, Wapping Heights uh, and Manassas Gap uh, to Walker, he says, hey, there's nothing to worry about. All that's in front of us is some Yankee cavalry. Uh, and, and they've been very quiet. You should have no problem. Well, it turns out that that's not not the case uh, because about uh, noon of uh, July 22nd, Meade has finally received enough information from his signal corps stations in the mountains uh, to conclude that the Confederates are in fact uh, leaving the valley. Uh, the Union spotters here have seen the long wagon trains moving down from Bunker Hill uh, through Winchester uh, toward Front Royal. Uh, and so Meade at noon puts his infantry in motion uh, for Manassas Gap. Now, he's, he's taking no chances. He leaves the 12th Corps to guard Snickers Gap, the 2nd Corps to guard Ashby's Gap. Uh, he takes uh, the 5th uh, the Corps and the reserve artillery, and he's going to put them in the center of the Loudoun Valley so they can move in either direction. Uh, the 11th Corps is going to extend here to the east, as is Gregg's cavalry, because the Union Army is beginning to run low with supplies. It hasn't been resupplied since it crossed the Potomac. It's been eating through its food. And before much longer, it's going to need, need to reconnect uh, with the supply depots around Washington, D.C. via the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. So Meade's beginning to reach out toward Warrenton uh, and the ONA, but he's shifting most of his army, particularly uh, the, the third, the first, and the fifth corps uh, toward Manassas Gap with the intention of shoving their way through Manassas Gap and reaching Front Royal and cutting off what he believes are Ewell and Hills Corps, which are still here in the Valley. Uh, so they know that Longstreet's in Chester's Gap and is trying to get through it, but remember the Federals have now become confused and they think that Ewell's two divisions are his entire Corps and that early single division is Hill's uh, entire Corps. Uh, and so Meade uh, is not playing um, the game with a full understanding of the cards that uh, are on the table, uh, but he believes that he has a chance here, if not to wreck the entire Army of Northern Virginia, to wreck two thirds of the Army of Northern Virginia. And so now this business here in Manassas Gap uh, becomes all important. And on the night of the 22nd, the third Corps sends one division in uh, to uh, reinforce merit. Uh, and at 10 o'clock on the morning of the 23rd, uh, that division is going to show up uh, at Linden. And Walker's 600-man uh, brigade, which believed that it had nothing to worry about, there were just some complacent Yankee cavalry uh, about a mile in front of it, uh, suddenly sees uh, a whole federal infantry division appear. And a few hours later, the rest of the federal third corps uh, shows up. Uh, and the Fifth Corps is on the road uh, toward uh, Manassas Gap as well. Uh, the Third Corps is under the command of Major General William F. French, uh, who had taken over uh, from the disabled Sickles following the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, he is commanding a corps for the very first time. Most of his fighting has been as a division commander in the second corps where he is units have had some pretty bad luck. He got to attack the sunken road at Antietam, the Stonewall uh, at Fredericksburg. He got to try and stop Stonewall Jackson's flank attack at Chancellorsville. Uh, in other words, uh, French has learned caution <laughs> and understandably so. And as he moves his troops into Manassas Gap, uh, he sees these tall mountainsides uh, on either flank uh, he has a very easy time imagining that there are Confederates up in those hills waiting for him to, to walk into a trap and then attack him uh, from high ground uh, on, on both sides. And so he's very, very careful. He, he doesn't want to push things too hard until he knows the Fifth Corps is up uh, to uh, support him. And so uh, this is much to the benefit of Colonel Walker, whose 600 men are now facing something like, you know, 15,000 uh, Federals. Uh, they have a signal corps detachment uh, with them. They send word back uh, that they need help. Uh, this is going to bring uh, General Ewell and General Robert Rhodes galloping into the past to look over the situation. And they get here and they see this massive Federal force deploying. 
Uh, now, French takes his time. He spends from 11 to 3 o'clock uh, shaking out his command. He's going to send batteries and regiments uh, up into the mountains on his flank to guard every little uh, trail uh, and defile to, to protect against a sudden uh, surprise attack uh, by hidden rebels. Uh, and it's not until 3 p.m. Uh, that he's going to actually begin to push. Uh, and this is going to give the Confederates a, a, a huge gift because that morning, uh, Rhodes and Allegheny Johnson's divisions are still six hours away from Manassas Gap. Uh, and if the Federals were to get to Front Royal, they would cut off Ewell's Corps uh, and, and potentially be able to destroy it by hurling most of the Army of the Potomac at it uh, the next day. So Walker is told uh, by Ewell that he has to hold uh, on for dear life to gain every minute possible. Uh, and uh, this is what Walker and his Georgians actually managed to do against all the odds, in, in large part uh, because French is very cautious. So between 11 and 3, uh, the Federals merely uh, contest uh, the high ground of Wapping Heights, along which the first line of Walker's brigade is deployed, uh, with skirmishing. And it's it's kind of a it's kind of a lackadaisical uh, skirmish. Both armies are very hungry. Uh, both are worn out from Gettysburg. Uh, and this part of Virginia at this season of the year is simply covered in dewberries. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the Confederates and the Federals who, who take part in this fight uh, would, would fire their weapon. They would pause to gather in a fistful of blueberries. They would eat the blueberries. They would reload. They would shoot their weapon. Then they would grab and eat more blueberries uh, and it was sort of an opera buffet uh, kind of a fight, as one federal uh, soldier put it, especially if, if, if you remembered uh, the, how horrendous the Battle of Gettysburg had been just, just 20 days before. Uh, around 3 o'clock, uh, the uh, 5th Corps is beginning to arrive near Linden. Uh, that reassures uh, General French, who finally orders an assault on Wapping Heights, the 3rd and 4th Maine managed to break the Confederate line. Uh, General Walker is badly wounded in the leg and, and is forced to relinquish uh, command uh, to uh, Captain uh, Charles Andrews, uh, who's going to do a very fine job uh, running the show for the Confederates uh, uh, from this point. And the Confederate first line retreats at what one Yankee says, a gentle cow trot, uh, 600 yards to a second line on high ground. Uh, the Federals under uh, General Hobart Ward, who've been running this skirmish, sweep up onto Wapping Heights. Uh, but at this moment, uh, General French decides that he's going to send in a fresh unit to attack uh, this second enemy position. And he calls forward uh, a, a division under uh, Brigadier General uh, Henry Prince uh, and tells him to select a brigade uh, to attack the Confederate position. Uh, he uh, selects the Excelsior Brigade, the 70th, 71st, 72nd, 73rd, 74th New York, who under uh, the command right now of a political general, Brigadier General Francis Spinola, who is a replacement for a Gettysburg uh, casualty. Uh, but by the time uh, that Spinola is ready to launch his attack, Rhodes Division has now made it to the battlefield. And so the, the cautious federal approach and the stout defense uh, by uh, by uh, Walker's brigade has bought the time that Ewell needed. And Rhodes' leading elements have gotten onto the field. Uh, a, a battalion of sharpshooters uh, are in the mountains on the north side of Manassas Gap. O'Neill's brigade is here to back up uh, uh, Andrew's men. Uh, the five o'clock attack by the Excelsior Brigade is a very dramatic thing. Uh, the Federals are, are attacking almost up a... Uh, a 90 degree uh, incline in some places they have to pull their themselves up by grabbing small trees and and weeds they're taking <clears throat> fire from the front fire from the flank uh, but they push forward with great gallantry against the confederate line that is thin and running out of ammunition uh, and they manage to to break the rebel line and force the confederates into retreat uh, one of the interesting things about this uh, this fight is that federal troops to the East and Confederate troops to the West uh, were on ground higher 
uh, than that where the action is taking place. And so this is a, kind of like an amphitheater here. Uh, and men on both sides were cheering uh, their comrades who were engaged in the battle, almost as though they were watching uh, a football game. Uh, the Federals managed to, to get this, uh, this high ground here, but it is now so late in the day uh, that they've missed their chance to push through uh, to Front Royal. Rose Division has taken a position on Green Mountain, which is a thousand feet in height uh, and blocks the exit uh, of Manassas Gap uh, to Front Royal. Wright and O'Neill are down here. Blackford sharpshooters are up here. Johnson's division uh, is, is in reserve. Uh, and nightfall has come down uh, before the Federals can take advantage of Spinola's uh, success. Uh, in, in shoving the Confederates backward uh, toward uh, Green Mountain. Meade is on the scene. He's watched all of this. He doesn't seem overly concerned uh, with French's caution, uh, but he does now perceive there to be a great opportunity. The Federals have taken prisoners from all three of Lee's corps over the span of a couple of days. And so this seems to confirm uh, Meade's understanding of the situation. Uh, he's also seen some Confederate forces turn around from Chester's Gap and come back toward Front Royal. Now, this is, in fact, uh, just some Confederate artillery that's got tired of the, the traffic jam uh, and is going to take a different route uh, to uh, Culpeper County. But this looks like the attack in Manassas Gap has forced the Confederates to recall troops from Chester's Gap. Uh, if you've got Ewell's Corps in front of you and you believe that Early's division, which is still up here, uh, is Hill's entire corps, uh, then you are pretty confident that you've got two Confederate corps that are here. And if you can shove your way through Manassas Gap and take Front Royal, you'll cut them off uh, and be able to destroy them by getting the bulk of the Army of the Potomac below them and trapping them against the south bank of uh, of the Potomac uh, River. Uh, so this is what Meade thinks is possible. And so on the night of July 23rd, around the little village of Linden, which you see right here, he masses the 3rd, the 5th, and the 2nd Corps, 37,000 men with their attendant batteries. There were so many Federals uh, packed together in such a small space that it was said that men could not lay down to sleep. They actually had to sleep uh, setting up uh, with their backs against one another. Uh, to make it worse, the Federals are all but out of rations now. Meade is ordering his men to go on half rations. Uh, but all of this is worth it because in the morning, uh, he anticipates smashing his way through the Confederate line, taking Front Royal, trapping two-thirds of the Army of Northern Virginia in the lower Shenandoah Valley uh, where it can be destroyed. That's not going to happen, of course, because overnight, uh, Ewell has slipped away, moved into the Lurie Valley, uh, and has begun his retreat uh, toward Culpeper County. Uh, the uh, division of Early is going to detour through Strasburg and move uh, up the valley uh, to New Market uh, to cross through uh, Fisher's Gap uh, on its way uh, to Culpeper County as well. And so on the morning, of uh, July 24th, uh, the Federals begin their big push in Manassas Gap and very quickly uh, realize uh, that the Confederates are not there, they are gone. Uh, the leading elements in the Third Corps actually get to Front Royal, uh, see the distant dust cloud of the Confederate rear guard, uh, and know that uh, Lee has once again escaped their grasp. Uh, and so word is sent back to Meade uh, that the Confederates are gone, Meade has to pivot his army immediately and race it toward Warrenton over the next two days in order to get it uh, to where it can be resupplied via the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. And so Meade goes off to the northeast toward Warrenton while the Army of Northern Virginia concentrates uh, around Culpeper uh, Courthouse. And for the first time, really since the Battle of Gettysburg, the two armies are going to uh, break contact. The Federals are retreating in one direction. Uh, the Federals are going, uh, the Confederates rather, going in the other. Here's a picture drawn by Alfred Wode uh, showing the Union Army uh, exiting uh, Manassas Gap uh, after uh, its disappointing operations there. There will be some skirmishes with Kilpatrick's cavalry uh, as the Confederates uh, move toward Culpeper. 
uh, dramatic actions that don't really slow the Confederates down in any significant way. Uh, and uh, they're sort of the denouement uh, of this uh, series of uh, maneuvers. Uh, the fighting uh, has been intense uh, and the marching has been worse. Uh, it's extremely hot temperatures in the upper 80s uh, have been very taxing on the troops. Uh, but in terms of the number of men who've been uh, killed, wounded, or captured, uh, casualties are fairly modest. 332 Federals, only 50 of whom are dead. 324 Confederates, only 26 of whom are dead. Almost all of those uh, are from uh, uh, Wright's Brigade uh, uh, and had been lost uh, in Manassas uh, Gap. Uh, but for this very small price in casualties, Lee has managed to elude the Army of the Potomac and get his army into uh, safe environs around Culpeper Courthouse, where it will be given a chance to, uh, to recover uh, from uh, the Battle of Gettysburg and set the stage for the operations that will take place in the fall and late summer uh, of 1863. And so this is when, where, and how the Gettysburg campaign actually comes to an end uh, along the banks of the Rappahannock River uh, at the end of July, not along the banks of the Potomac uh, in the middle of that same uh, month. Uh, and so uh, that is the story of the first book in my Meet and Lee series. The, the second book, uh, Meet and Lee at Bristow Station, looks at operations in August, September, and October of 63, including the Bristow Station campaign. The third uh, book covers uh, the uh, Rappahannock Station campaign and the battles of Rappahannock Station uh, and Kelly's Ford. And the fourth and final book, uh, which hopefully will be out soon, will cover the uh, Mine Run uh, campaign. Uh, if you'd like to get a, a signed copy of one of my books, uh, you can certainly email me uh, and be happy to work out the details with you. Of course, these books are also available from Savas Beatty uh, and uh, most of the online uh, retailers uh, as well. And I hope you uh, have the opportunity uh, to uh, take a look at them. Uh, well, one thing is certain, uh, the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia did not end the Gettysburg campaign uh, on July 14th, 1863 along the Potomac, nor did they end the operations of 1863 uh, there either. This is going to be a very vibrant and a very active period uh, and one that is deserving uh, of as much attention as any other campaign uh, waged by these two uh, very important and very famous armies.